All right, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here this morning, and let me ask you to turn in your Bibles to 1 John. If you go back to the end of the Bible, Revelation, you have Revelation, Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. Those four little books before Revelation are very small. 1 John chapter 1, as we're in now week number 2 in the series, Walk Like Jesus Walked. And I hope that you were able uh, to view last Sunday. We weren't able to be here last Sunday due to the weather and the frozen roads and everything else. But I hope you were able to watch uh, online. And if you did not and you want to catch up, it's there. And uh, go to our, our website, click on podcast, and you'll find it and be able to watch at your leisure. Um, when Spurgeon was here, Doug Whitley was here back in December. I was here that Sunday listening to him and, and present Spurgeon's sermon on the will of God. And uh, one of the points that, um, that Mr. Spurgeon made was the fact that uh, our plans really don't matter. Uh, it's God's plan that matters. And so we approach life and approach our schedule and approach our calendar with the idea that if God wills, we'll do this and that today. <clears throat> it was not God's will for me to be here today with you. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, right now, in fact, as you're watching this, I'm in Texas, either getting ready to get on an airplane or I've already boarded the plane, one or the other. But uh, on my way home with Andy today from attending a funeral um, in our family. So it wasn't God's will for me to be here today physically, but thanks to God, uh, we have the ability now to, uh, to record uh, the message earlier and to uh, present it to you in this fashion. But I hope we don't do this often because I would much, much rather be with you. I've been away for so long from standing here and looking at faces and people since uh, I had my sabbatical and uh, it just keeps getting put off, it seems like. But I'm glad you're here, and I hope you have your Bible open, and we're going to continue on with our series. Look with me at 1 John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. We'll begin there. John writes and says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and touched with our hands concerning the word of life? That life was revealed, and we have seen it, and we testify and declare it to you, the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you, so that you, he's talking to the churches there, that you might have fellowship along with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this may be the first time that you've ever read that passage, or maybe you've read it many times, and you might be wondering why John says, he begins with, what was from the beginning, or maybe your translation says, that was from the beginning, instead of who was from the beginning. Because it's pretty clear as you read through this that John is describing a person, and the person that John is describing is Jesus Christ. And it's not only the person of Jesus, but he's talking about not just Jesus himself, but he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about all that Jesus did, all that Jesus said. He's talking about the total package. So he says, what? Everything that was from the beginning. At the beginning of the gospel that this St. John, this Apostle John wrote, he used the same similar wording to describe Jesus. He wrote these words in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word, and he calls Jesus the word here in 1 John, the word became flesh. In other words, became a man. We just celebrated Christmas a few weeks ago. When God came to earth and became human flesh, became a man. He became flesh and took up residence. He lived among us. We observed his glory the glory as the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. And at the end of his gospel, that's what he said at the beginning, and then when he gets to the very end of his gospel in chapter 21, verse 25, John wrote this about what he and the others, the other apostles, had observed in their three plus years of traveling and living with Jesus and listening to him. He said, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books 
that would be written. I've been to, have you ever been to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C.? I went there to do a project, a research project, my senior year of college, and uh, with two other guys. And we walked into the Library of Congress, and, and, and honest to goodness, as I looked around and saw the thousands upon thousands upon, must be hundreds of thousands, or maybe even more than that, books everywhere, it gave me a headache. There were so many books. John says, I, if everything that Jesus was recorded, it would be more than, than you and I could imagine. Now, what was, he said, from the beginning? What is the beginning? Well, the beginning most likely refers to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's not talking, I don't believe here, about from the beginning, uh, from eternity past, from the beginning, like Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created. I don't believe he's talking about that beginning. I believe he's speaking of Jesus' ministry and his beginning there. And you say, why do you say that? Why isn't it from the all the way back from creation? Wasn't Jesus from the before creation? Absolutely. He's the creator. Why does that not mean that here? And, and one of the answers, he said, because we have seen, we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have observed. Nobody heard, nobody observed, nobody saw, nobody touched Jesus until he came when? In the first century when he was born in Bethlehem. Beginning doesn't always mean like in Genesis 1.1. If you look at chapter 2, verse 7, just drop down across the page in your Bible to chapter 2, verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you had from when? The beginning. The beginning. From what beginning? When did these Christians that John writes this letter to, when did they get this first command that he's speaking about? Well, they got it from their first exposure to the gospel, to the word of God, which for these churches now, when John writes this letter, and he's a very old man, and it's toward the end of the first century, they've had the gospel for a while, a good while. The written gospels have been around for per perhaps 30 to 40 years. John's gospel, scholars tell us, was likely the last of the four gospels written maybe just 10 years prior to this letter, but they've gotten the Gospels and they've gotten evangelism and Paul was there 30 to 40 years earlier. So they, when he speaks of the beginning here, he's going back to their first exposure to Jesus when they believed in him. For these believers, that's the beginning, when they first received the gospel. If you're a Christian, I hope today, if you're a believer in Jesus, um, you can Go back and remember when you first received Christ, when you first heard the gospel and God's spirit said, hey, believe this. And I did as a 10-year-old boy. I remember that event in my life very, very well. Well, John and the other apostles witnessed Jesus' life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension. They saw all of that. They heard Jesus' own voice. They saw him with their own eyes. They touched him with their own hands. They observed him with their own curiosity and amazement. And this isn't the story that John's saying to them. What this apologetic, if you will, that he's giving them here isn't new to the churches. They've probably already been taught, I would imagine, these things over the years and likely have read John's gospel. So why then does he begin this letter to people who are already believers? And I said this last week, 1 John is written to believers. Don't let anybody tell you it's written to non-believers or to pretend believers. It's written to believers. Why then does he begin with the defense and apologetic of Jesus being the eternal son of God who came to the earth in the form of a man, something they already know? Why does he proclaim to them, and I'm a witness of this. I saw him. I heard him. I observed him. I touched him. I was with him. Why? Well, there was a false teaching spreading throughout the churches in that part of the world at the end of the first century called Gnosticism. Maybe you've heard that word. Maybe you've heard us talk about that before. It comes Gnosticism. The word comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. Our word that we might use in our vocabulary today, you know you're familiar with the word agnostic. Well, it's a compound word. The letter A before the word means without. So agnostic means without knowledge, no knowledge. So if someone says to you, you know, you talk to them about your faith in Christ and they say, well, I'm an agnostic. They mean, I don't know. 
if God exists or not. These Gnostics in the first century, these people that claim to have this knowledge, professed to be Christians, yet they claim to have superior knowledge about spiritual things, superior that, to what the rest of the Christianity had in that day, to what we have, superior to that, including, they said, we have superior knowledge of, than the apostles who walked and talked with Jesus. That would include John. Well, these false teachers, and false teaching is what we call a cult, these false teachers, this cult was effectively infiltrating the churches. They claim to have, the Gnostics did, have deeper truths about what the apostles, the men who wrote our New Testament, inspired by God to write the scriptures. They said, we've got, we got more truth than, they, than they've given you. Some taught in the Gnosticism, what did they believe? Some taught that all matter was evil. So everything that you see in this room, everything that you go outside and see, all matter, whether it's living or whether, whether it's, it's not, all matter is evil. Evil And since all matter is evil, they taught Jesus became a man, and when he became a man, he ceased to be God. They taught that Jesus became Christ. He did not become Christ Jesus, they teach, they taught, until he was baptized, and that before he was crucified, when he was nailed to the cross, he went back to being a man. Why? Well, Christ, Messiah, the anointed one of God, they reasoned, cannot die, and he, Jesus died on the cross. That can't be God. So part of this letter that John writes to the churches is a warning to them that Gnosticism doesn't have the knowledge they claim to have, and they're a false cult. Here's a great example, church. Great example of why, and you, you've heard, you hear this over and over from us here at Nag Said Church as we teach. Great example of why it is so essential to your faith and your stability as a believer to know what the Bible says and what it doesn't. And you're foolish. Let me say, because I, I know this kind of thought sometimes happens among church people. You're foolish to say or to think that, well, you know what? I'll just leave all that theology and all that knowledge stuff, I'll leave that all up to Rick and trust him to tell me. Listen to me. Please listen to this. Some better known and better educated preachers than me have strayed away from the Word of God and are leading others away from the Word of God. You need to be a student. 2 Timothy 2.15. You need to be a student of the word. And as I've said before so many times, and I know some of you haven't quite grasped what, uh, what I'm saying, you need to be a theologian. You need to know what you believe. So that helps us understand John's introduction to this letter. And here in the first four verses, he lets all his readers know, hey, you know what? I know Jesus. And he, he's telling them, I mean, I know Jesus not just in a spiritual way, but I knew him when he was a living, breathing man walking on the streets of Judea and Galilee. I was there with him. So here's where John's going to go in this letter. Several key words are found throughout this letter, and he's going to repeat them. Let me give you several key words in John, in this uh, letter of 1 John. The first one is the word walk. It's found twice in chapter 2, and, and I covered this a bit last Sunday. And so again, if you'll look at chapter 2, verse 5, the latter part of the verse, and verse 6, I said this is, the, this is the theme passage of this series that we're in now until Easter. Let's read it together. I, want you, I know I'm not here with you, but I'm going to read it. I want you to read it aloud with me. Will you do that? 1 John chapter 2, 5 and 6. This is how we know we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. And the word walk as it's used by John and so many times by Paul means live. Live like Jesus lived. We're to live like Jesus. A second key word in 1 John is the word love. It's found in 22 different passages. In some of those verses, it's found in multiple, in multiple times. 
It's, it's this word for love, and I went through the entire book of 1 John and looked up every time the word love was found, and it's the word agape, or a form of the word agape. It's God's love that John talks about here. It's not the kind of love that, we might, that I might say, you know, I love my truck. It's not anything we can come up with in our own human lives apart from a relationship with, with God. It's not even the kind of love with which I love my children or I love my wife. It's a superior love to that. It's divine love, agape. And it's every time the word love that we'll find as we go through 1 John, it's that word agape. And he's talking about John throughout this book so many times about this divine, sacrificial, supernatural love. And John will tell us, similarly to how Paul explained love in 1 Corinthians 13, same word. John will show us in 1 John how this love of God applies in our lives and as we share it with other people. A third word that's important in this book is the word sin. Sin is found in 11 different verses. You know, the little kid came home from Sunday school and and, uh, and church and, and, and mom and dad, as I hope your parents do with, with your children, uh, after uh, they've been up in Cowabunga Cove or a youth group, you sit down with them and say, so tell me, today, what, was it, what was it about today? What was the lesson about today? What did you learn today? And, you know, the little boy uh, got home and mom and dad said, well, Johnny, what did you learn? What did the preacher preach about today? And, of course, Johnny, he, he had been fidgeting and he had been, his mind was all over the place sitting in church, which is why we have Cowabunga Cove, so their mind can focus on the things of God. Johnny, Johnny thought for a moment, and what did the preacher preach about? He preached about sin. <laughs> well, a lot of times that comes up in messages, doesn't it? Uh, sin is found uh, in the book of 1 John in uh, at least 11 verses, and, and the whole idea is not complicated. In fact, John will define sin for us in chapter 3, verse 4, and he defines it simply as sin is something, anything we do that breaks God's law. And we'll see in 1 John, he's going to take us and teach us this, how sin negatively impacts our fellowship and knowledge of God. Our sin, my sin, your sin, let's be honest about it, is the culprit that, that becomes a wedge, if there is one, between us and God. Another important word in 1 John is the word know, K-N-O-W, know, at least 28 times in 1 John. So if it's that many times in this little five-chapter letter, it must be an important word for us to understand. And so are the others, love and sin and, and so forth. John, But it seems John really wanted us to know some things. And so he's going to talk about that and use that a lot. The word we're going to kind of look at today that's, that's only found in three verses, but they're all here in chapter 1, an important word in 1 John as he introduces his book, is the word fellowship. Fellowship. Now, for those of you who are guests today, you might not know this. We don't talk a whole lot about it, but we are a, a Baptist church here at Nags Head. And I've been a Baptist just, I guess, pretty much my whole Christian life. And one thing I know about Baptists is that we often think of fellowship as that time when we come to church or we come to a small group or whatever it might be, a picnic, and we bring food and we drink and we eat too much fried chicken, potato salad, and banana pudding, and we say, well, that was, that was good fellowship. We tend to equate fellowship with food. But while fellowship can include eating, and I think often it does, uh, Jesus sat around the table with lots of different people and ate while he taught them, and they had fellowship with him. While it can include food, and that's why I believe Jesus probably was a Baptist, it can include food, doesn't have to. It's kind of like worship can include singing, but it doesn't have to. Fellowship is not food. Fellowship is the idea that we are walking, and the word walk again means to live, that we are walking together. We're walking in unity. We're walking in agreement that we are partners. That word for fellowship means partnership. It's our participation, get this now, together. And so I hope this morning that there is some fellowship going on here in this gathering this Sunday morning, especially before and after 
the gathering. The reason that when we built this building 11 years ago that we said to the architect, we want you to include as big a lobby as we can in this building. The reason that we included such a big lobby was to encourage fellowship. That was the purpose of it. It's why when you come on Sunday morning, let me step on some toes here, it's why you ought to arrive early and leave late. You need to hang out with your brothers and sisters and spend some time in fellowship with them. Fellowship, by the way, is the same word translated in the New Testament as communion. When we gather around the Lord's table and eat the bread and drink from the cup, signifying what? What does communion signify? It signifies I am, we are in fellowship with Christ and with one another. But here in this passage, John also uses the word fellowship to mean something in the relationship that God desires to have with you and me. Fellowship is part of that relationship. It's not the same as the relationship, but it goes in the relationship. It means in this relationship that Christians have with God, that I explained last week, remember? Little children, fathers, young men, and they, we all have this, these relate, this relationship with God through our new birth and through our growth and through the word of God and through the thing, things that we overcome. We have this relationship with God, which means in this relationship, we're walking the same path, Christians. We're, we're going the same direction. And let me use marriage, if I can, to illustrate fellowship. Gail and I were married Well, I should say this. Gail and I are married. Aren't you glad to know that? And we have been married since we said those vows on that warm June evening so very long ago. We wear rings. I still have mine. We wear, and she still has hers. We we wear rings that we gave to one another in that ceremony. I professed to her, standing beside her and looking lovingly into her eyes, I I profess to her that, Gail, I am accepting you as my wife. And she said to me, and Rick, I am accepting you as my husband. We profess that acceptance of one another to each other. And then when the ceremony was about over, the minister pronounced us as husband and wife in front of all those people. We have a document that says we're married. We have rings that say we're married. We have this relationship called matrimony. That's our relationship. And in a healthy relationship, and we've had that relationship for 40 plus years, in a healthy relationship, there needs to be fellowship. I was having a conversation just the other day with a young lady, young married uh, lady who is also a young mother, and she was saying to me how ever since her, their baby has been born, listen to me, and the baby's like, I don't know, nine, ten months old, ever since the baby's been born, they have not been out on a date. And that concerned her, and I said to her, that should concern you. You need to continue working on that fellowship part of your relationship. Fellowship is part of the marital relationship. Now, in our, Gail and I, in our 40 plus years that we have been in this marriage relationship, there have been times when we haven't been in fellowship with one another. Do you know where I'm going with this? And, and I'll, I'll confess, almost every time that we've not had fellowship with one another, it's, it's almost always my fault said the wrong thing, made the wrong face, (laughs) didn't do the right thing. And suddenly, guys, suddenly the house gets cold and quiet. You know what I mean? What's happened? Are we still married when those kinds of things take place? Are we still married? Yeah, we are still married. Still got the rings, still have the paper that says we are. And since June 18th, 1977, that relationship has not changed because we said to one another, essentially, until we die. It has not changed. The relationship has not changed. But what has changed, not relationship, what has changed is fellowship. 
fellowship's been messed up. It's been hampered. 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, G, John says, Jesus was, if you look there with me, he said, he said in, uh, and we testify and declare to you the eternal life, talking about Jesus, that was with the Father. The word with here that John uses, the Greek word means, literally means they were face to face. And isn't that part of what fellowship is? It's being with someone. That's why, you know, people talk about all their friends they have on Facebook. And, you know, I have people who are my friends on Facebook that, that I really couldn't tell you who they are, that I, that I haven't met. I don't have many like that. I try not to go there. But, but I really, they're not really my friends. We don't have any fellowship. Why? Because we're not face to face and we haven't ever been. And here, the word that John uses is face to face and they were face to face from when? From eternity, John says. They have always, father and son, been in fellowship, always. Some people think, you know, well, why did God create human beings? Well, then somebody will come up with the answer. Maybe he was lonely, but the truth is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have had perfect fellowship from eternity. There's never been a moment when they did not have that perfect fellowship except one. And that was when the Son of God became sin for you and me and his Father, his perfect, righteous, holy Father, could not look on his sin, on our sin, on Jesus, could not look on him as our sin and turned his back on him and abandoned him at that moment that for a very temporary time, their fellowship was broken. Why? Because of sin. Because of sin. Our sin, not Jesus. But he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. They've always had perfect fellowship from eternity, which means that, that all the way back to eternity, they, they had no need. Gosh, man, well, I'm sure I'm lonely. What about you? Yeah, me too. There was none of that. They didn't need to hang with us. And not only that, John wanted these early Christians to know that we all have, as Christians, fellowship together with the Father and the Son. That's one of the benefits of being a believer. Here's, he says, this is why I'm writing this letter. So you can have this same fellowship with the Father and Son that we, the apostles, enjoy. Because we've been with Jesus. We know Jesus. We know the Father. We can together, apostles and, and Christians, all of us who know Jesus together can have this wonderful togetherness with God. Christianity is a family. It's a fellowship. It is a community. And the Bible teaches that none of us, please hear me, and, and I realize I'm preaching to the choir here this morning because you're here. But none of us who profess to know Jesus Christ as our Savior can truly live this life that Jesus saved us for on our own. Impossible. You can't do it. Why? Because we belong to one another in fellowship, and God's plan for living that out is the church. Now, let me just throw in a little advertisement. If you've been attending the Egg Said Church, and you say, I love this fellowship, I love this church, I want to become a part of it, you need to be in my class next Sunday afternoon, God willing, uh, Discovering Life at Nag Said Church. Right after the 11 o'clock gathering for a couple hours Sunday afternoon, we'll feed you lunch, but you need, if you haven't signed up yet, please take out a communication card and turn it in today and say, put me in Rick's class. And on the back, you can check off that class, Discovering Life at Nags Head Church. I'd love to have you there so you can be a part of this fellowship, and we'll tell you how to do that in the class. Then in verse 4, he says he has another goal in mind for them as they read this epistle. He says, Look at verse 4. We are writing the, these things so that our joy may be complete. Joy. What is joy? Joy is not happiness. They're two different things. A lot of people think happiness is joy, and so when they're happiness, they're not happy. They say, oh, I've lost my joy. No. Happiness depends on happenings, things that go on in my life. Good things happen, I'm happy. Bad things happen, not so much. And that's normal, and that's supposed to be that way, but joy is different. Joy, on the other hand, is dependent on this fellowship that I can have with God. 
knowing that he loves me, knowing that he is in control, knowing that he will never abandon me. He lives within me, and he lives through me, through his Holy Spirit. So joy, hear me, joy, Christian, is something that never leaves us. You say, well, sometimes I just don't think I have that joy. You know, where did it go? Remember, it's dependent on what? On fellowship with God. And, and sometimes it's not so much that we have done wrong things, but we forget who God is in our lives. And we forget this relationship that we have with him and this fellowship that we have with him. And sometimes joy seems to be lost because it gets buried under a lot of our own baggage. You know what I'm talking about? And maybe for you, maybe you would say, you know, I've been a Christian a long time, but it's been a long time since I understood joy. Maybe it's been buried under that baggage for a long time. Now, what do we do? If you watched last Sunday's message, you heard that our victory over sin and our victory over the world is tied to our relationship with the Word of God. Last Sunday, go up back and read chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. Our victory over sin, our victory over the world, a word, our ability to overcome those things is tied, John says, to the word of God. And so it, it, we understand John to be saying a Christian who is weak in the word, the Bible, is going to be weak in life and everything that life throws at us. In the same way, John is saying that our joy here in chapter 1, he says, I'm writing this so our joy may be complete, full. Our joy is full. Our joy is complete. Our joy is filled up to the top. When we are in this fellowship with God and with one another. Why is that? Well, there should never be There should never be loneliness. Remember, I talked about God the Father and the Son and the Spirit, eternity past, we're never lonely. There should never be loneliness within the family of God. And here's why. It's because we have fellowship. We have partnership. We have communion with each other. Whether it's on Sunday morning and we're here at a worship gathering, whether it's in your connection group when you're gathered with with eight or 10 or 12 other Christians, studying the word together and praying together. What great fellowship is that? Eating a piece of pie together. Whether we're in a connection group or on a ministry team serving together, that's also a form of fellowship. You have others in the body of believers, in the family of faith, in the church, in the community, in the fellowship of the church. You have others to share life with and to here, here's, here's such an important thing, to lean on in the hard times. And even if you ever find yourself really, truly alone, and there's no Christians around you, no brothers and sisters, and maybe you're somewhere far away and you can't get up with anybody and you can't pray with anybody, nobody can come hold your hand and cry with you and help walk you through whatever it is, the dark valley that you're going through, you still are always permanently in this relationship with God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And the fellowship with them is there and it's available to us. And they, those three in one, the Trinity, God, they love you and care for you more than anyone else on earth. What was from the beginning? We have heard with our eyes. We have We have seen, or heard with our ears, we have seen with our eyes, we have observed, we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That life was revealed in Jesus Christ, John says. We've seen it. And we testify and declare it to you. What was John talking about? He was talking about the fact that Jesus came to establish a relationship first with us with you, with me. And if you're here this morning, and maybe it's your first time here, maybe you've been here many times, but 
you still don't have in life that kind of relationship with God that he designed you to have, that he gave his son Jesus to die for you and rise from the dead for you to have. He's ready. When Gail and I stood on that platform before that minister and we said those vows, I accept you as my husband, I accept you as my wife, we were ready for that. We anticipated that moment for a long time. We were ready for that. God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, listen to me. If you don't know him yet as your Savior, you don't have that relationship. They, God, is ready to accept you into his family right now. Well, I'm not ready for that. Well, then what do you have to do to be? You don't have to do anything to be ready other than say, God, I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. And if you're willing to accept me, I most gladly accept you. And by faith, you put your trust in Jesus Christ, what he did for you. You may not understand it all. Who does? But you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that he's the one and only Savior, that he lived and died for you, that you might have life. If you don't have that relationship, you can't have this fellowship. And God created you to have it. He wants you to have it. He'd love for you to have it today. Would you bow for me, with me for prayer? After we sing in just a moment, our pastors are going to be standing here at the front, and they would love more than anything else for you to come up and say, say to them, I, I need that relationship with Jesus today. And they'll walk you through it. And today you can leave this building in relationship with God and in fellowship with him. And there's nothing like it in all this world. Let's pray. Father, as we bow right now, we thank you that the evidence was clear. At the end of the first century, as John is probably the last living of the apostles, and, and he said, listen, I, I just want to say one more time to you. I saw him. I knew him. I heard him. I touched him. I traveled with him. I listened to what he said. I, I, and I want to just one more time say to you, Christians, he's real. He's real. And I want to say to you that you can know him and you can have relationship with God and fellowship with Jesus and the Father and the Spirit and thank you for that. How in the world do people go through life, Lord, without knowing you? So I pray this morning for any who might be here that need to establish that relationship, that today might be the day of their new birth whether right there where they sit, they say, Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all necessarily, but I believe you love me and that you died for my sin and I accept you as my Savior. And when they come up, and I hope they will come up and talk to our pastors and, and express that desire to today, settle their eternity, to have eternal life, to have their sins forgiven. I pray these things in Jesus' name.